Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you that as you are trying to relay things to us to help move us forward in life, I thank you, Father, uh, that the revelations that we need to see and hear a great teacher, Holy Spirit, be in us to understand and know the things that you have decided to do and to, to show us the truth that we need to apply to our life and father walk in the victory uh, that your word prov- provides for us every time we follow it because love never fails and your word is spoken out of love and so i thank you for it in jesus name amen, amen. all right <coughs> How today's message, which is blame sham, I call it the blame sham. Y'all know what a sham is, right? Y'all know what a sham is? No? Who wants to explain what a sham is? A sham is when somebody is trying to cheat you, steal from you, uh, uh, to to, uh, take away from you, uh, to trick you, all those things. They, 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 They... a Ponzi scheme is a sham. Uh, anything that's trying to trick you to, you know, to take from an advantage of another person, and, and it's it's set up, it's it's built so that it would entrap people and then take what, you know, what they want. So, blame is a sham. Blame is is something that the devil constructed, and man, I mean, that was the first thing man did after the sin, is blame. No, that's it. We'll probably read it today. In fact, we will read it today. And what brought about this is recently um, I had to uh, take care of some business up in Dundalk for my father. And that was on a Monday. And I come home, go to work on Tuesday. Y'all heard of Fat Tuesday, right? You know what Fat Tuesday is? That's when they all get all fleshly down there in New Orleans just before Ash Wednesday. So they, they, they sow all their wild oats before they commit to, um, you know, consecration to God uh, in the Catholic religion. Well, I had a bad Tuesday. (laughs) It was was probably one of the worst days of this year for me. Because I was discontented in everything. I mean, there was not uh, nothing, nothing. Not, Not myself, not God, not my family, not anybody. I'm like, what in the world? Where in the world did this stuff come from? And I'm, I'm really confused about it. I was like, so I began to talk to Father, and I said, Father, what, what's, what's the deal, man? What's up? I'm, I'm, I'm beside myself on this one. I don't quite know what's going on on my own, but I know I have an unction from the Holy One, and I know all things. And what you know? I know all things. Amen. Amen. I, I tell you, I use that scripture on a regular basis. So, you know, I... You know, I don't ever want to say I don't know. I mean, there are some things I have to say I don't know too, but to be but when it comes to walking with God and how to walk with God, I know. If I'm in the anointing. There's nothing God is hiding from us. There really isn't. He's about revealing things. Amen. Now he may take his time in doing it, but he will reveal it. And I was asking myself, am I still blaming my father? Because what I heard from the Lord, he said, John, is a knee-jerk reaction, a muscle memory emotion. Y'all know what muscle memory is, right? That's, that's where your body does what it does, I mean, instinctually, because you just do it every day. Like, you know, and, and even if you didn't plan to do it, have you ever done that? I, I wasn't trying to do that, but I did it anyway. You know, I mean, and why'd you do it? Because instinctually, 
I do it every day. But today I didn't want to do that. But the reason I didn't want to do that, because it was going to do something that, you know, wouldn't flow right or whatever, you know, I'm trying to think of one, but I've had that happen. Where, oh, where, you know, I mean, even like at work, at, at, other, at my other job work, um, the, the, the um, you know, you can get used to putting things like a certain package into one particular truck. But if you don't look at the label and find out, I mean, I mean this truck gets them all the time. And, uh, and and so it just, you know, in my mind, almost, almost automatically says, well, it belongs in that truck. But if I don't look at that label, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that belongs in this truck. Somebody, you know. Or you have two boxes, the same company is sending them, uh, but they're for two different trucks. They're not for the same truck. So, you, you, you know, you can't go by just by the look of the box. You have to look at the label. It's, it's muscle memory. You just do it. Your body just does it. It's it, and it's a, and, and he said it's a muscle memory emotion. It's an, in other words, it's the it's the discontent feeling I used to have emotionally and I still have in muscle memory because I actually have no no resentment to my dad. I don't. I, I love him. I want him to go to heaven. I want to help him as much as I possibly can. So I asked myself, am I still blaming God or blaming my dad and all this and that? And it, it, it's, it's just the, my normal, in the past, emotional reaction before I realized that I had totally forgiven God, uh, my dad over this. Because I blamed him for everything, every reason in my life for being angry or poor never satisfied in life, just everything. I blamed him for it. And if I was going to have a relationship with him, my dad, then he was going to be the one to fix this mess. You know, because as far as I was concerned growing up, it was him who made the mess. Not me. I'm just a kid. <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't my fault. I'm just a kid. I had nothing to do with it. It was between him and my mom. But as a kid, I told it personally, right? Right? We know this. This happens. It's not nor unusual. We, we see this in lives and relationships. Say. So I thought that he needed to make the first moves to make things right. I found out later that he thought, because I was angry with him, that I didn't want any relationship with him. And that's something. We were both wrong and upset at each other and ourselves. See, pride on my part kept me from him, and guilt on his part kept him from me. You see how the devil worked that in? What was the goal? Separation. Separation. Divide and conquer. It's a simple ploy. Militarily, every, it's, it's the same tactic over and over and over again. The same tactic. It has never changed. The devil uses the same tricks he's always been using. And it's no different with every relationship you have in life. No different. And what's the reasons? What reasons are keeping us from having right relations with our family? work relations, and neighbors. What are those reasons? Now, people blaming other people, even God, all the time, and it becomes a crux for them to not have sound relationships with God or man. And yet, we're still responsible for truly loving them, God and man. You're still responsible for loving God and man, whether you do or you don't. Do you realize that? You owe. You owe love. Because God loves you. You owe it. You're responsible for walking in love regardless of what the other person does. Regardless of what you think God did to you. And I'm going to tell you, if it's bad, God didn't do it. The devil did it. The fallen world 
which is a result of the devil, is the reason. It's not God at all. He's done everything to fix, to heal, to restore. Let's go to Genesis 15. And see, we see here in Abraham's life how things came about for him. God brings this out. Genesis 15, 1, it says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid. So when God says do not be afraid, what's the problem? Fear. There's fear. Now, of course, Abram wasn't saved, but God was making covenant with him, making a relationship with him, developing a relationship with him. And he walked away from everything to follow God in what he was leading him to do in this relationship. And he says, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So do you see God as your shield and an exceedingly great reward? That's key. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So, what's that sound like to you? Huh? That sound like Abraham kind of blaming God for no offspring? That sound like it sounds like that to me. Maybe you see it differently. I don't know. But it sounds like he's kind of putting it on the Lord, isn't it? And behold, the word of the Lord, and you understand his wife was considered barren. So you can see this. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your be uh, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Well, who is his own body? Well, him and Sarah. Okay, Sarah is his own body. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of earth of the Chaldeans, and to give you this land uh, to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? He's talking about the land, not Isaac. So he said to him, bring me three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, turtle dove, and two young pig- and a young pigeon. And then he brought all those to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each one opposite of each other. But he did not cut the birds in two. But does he ever try to cut a bird in two that small? <clears throat> you can see why he didn't. Anyway, first thing I want to bring out here is, look, Abram feared. Okay? I'm going to propose this thought. So most people are hiding behind the Internet, YouTube, texting, avoidance, because they're afraid of other people. I'm also proposing that the reason you are having troubles in your own relationships is because you're fearful of something. What that person may do, what that person may take, what you may have to give up in order to maintain a sound and decent relationship, at least as far as your end concerns. You can't control what other people do. But as far as your end, I'm proposing that the the basis, the base reason for it is fear. Fear of rejection, fear of this. It could be fear of your life, even. And, And, you know, Sometimes it's good to separate. But you separate with intention of restoration. Now, it says God has done, the, you know, Abraham blames God for no child. 
And so God makes a covenant promise with him. And he becomes righteous with God. Notice it says that because he believed. What did he believe? At that point he believed, as it said here, shall your descendants be. So he believes that Isaac, or that, you know, Sarah was going to have a child. And God counted it as righteousness. You know what righteousness means, right? And other words, God says, okay, because you believe what I said, you're standing right with me. You stand right with me because you take my word and you believe it. And you act on it. Because he, remember, he left the Earl of Ur of Chaldeans to go follow into a land for his descendants to grow and possess. So, I mean, what what is the righteousness? Obeying the word of God. What is the word of God to people today? Accept Jesus and you have righteousness. Amen? It's the same thing. Same thing. It's very, it's, it's more simpler now, I think, than even then. You accept Jesus. So then, so God cuts a covenant with them. A covenant promise. Let's go to Hebrews 8. God cuts a promise. How many know God has promises? Amen. How many know that God has cut some promises through Jesus for you? Amen. Hebrews 8. And <clears throat> I'm going to read the sixth verse. It says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is, also, he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. See, we have a new covenant, and it's established on better promises, covenant promises. Why is it better? Well, because like Jesus said, Anyone who's the least in the kingdom of God is greater than anyone, uh, than even John the Baptist, who is the greatest prophet, according to the words of Jesus. Because he came and blazed the trail for his cousin to come through and preach salvation. I mean, look, that's, Jesus is the life-changing force of everything, amen? So he, he, he's there. So you can see why John the Baptist's responsibility was so important to the Lord. And now Paul goes on to say, For if that first covenant had been faultless, see, when you look up the word blame, it's when you point your finger at somebody's fault. That you say it's their fault. You get in a car accident, there's, there's going to, most of the time, unless they declare it no fault, most of the time they're going to try to find out whose fault it was. Because that's who they're going to charge. That's the insurance company that's going to pay up. I had that happen coming out from church. I was at that up at Montgomery Village. Going to make a left on the village? The guy hits my rear end. And I mean, I was stopped a long time. I mean, there was, it was at least almost a minute, and the guy still hits me. I mean, really? Well, that was no fault on my part. I was well, I was at the head, in front of the red light, sitting there, at least 30, 40 seconds, and then he comes up and pops me. <laughs> okay? Well, they, his insurance paid, mine did not. Here's the fault. If the new old covenant wasn't faultless, or words, it, it was something, but it was not the ultimate. It wasn't the better covenant. It wasn't established on the best promises. I believe the best promises is, is the person, Jesus Christ. You can't get any better than him in that relationship. That's the best. And it did. And it says, where the first covenant had been faultless, there then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
And we come to find out the mystery was he was also making a new covenant for all the Gentiles too. That was the mystery that came out from what Jesus did. Verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. See, that's the major difference between the Old and New Covenant. And it's such a major difference, that's why it's a better covenant. And I will be their God. Notice it was then, at that point, when the heart has been written on, that he is their God. And they shall be my people, and none of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of his brothers, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. So that's your, you, you understand? Who's your great reward? The Lord. He's my great reward. From the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And the reason that part there says it's ready to vanish away is because at the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, whoever wrote it, the, the temple was still in function. It was, not, it was before 70 A.D. So this was written before 70 A.D., it wasn't obsolete, so there was absolutely no temple to sacrifice animals anymore, which hasn't been ever since. And I hope never will. Never. It's obsolete. It's a deception. And if you see it happening, it's a deception. It's a deception. So, The new covenant removes the fault. See, they weren't faultless in the old covenant because the day they got the covenant, they broke it that very same day. <laughs> Isn't that very human? <laughs> the day you get it, you break it. You ever had that? You know, the first day I had this item and then I broke it. I did that with some of my toys growing up. First day I had it, and it broke. It, you know, see yourself as faultless. God don't blame you anymore. He could. I mean, if he did, it would be right. But he doesn't do that. It's a sham. Blaming is a construction of the enemy to separate you from God and from each other. It's a deception. What's God do when we sin? He just tells us the facts and says, you know what? It's going to happen because of that. He's not blaming. He's just simply telling you, look, this is what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, now, of course, at that point, you can blame other people, blame yourself even. But you don't have to with the Lord. Not, no. Okay, it happens. Okay. All right, Lord, we're going to go on from here then. We're going to walk together on this. And, the, and he'll walk you through it. Amen. So sometimes, you know, there are things that's going to have to walk you through. You know, part of faith walk, is 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 not only keeping your right words in line with scripture, in line with the revelation of God's word, but there's a time factor in walking. How many know that if you walk it takes you longer than if you run? Right? Okay. So like healing. Healing is an instant in the sense that everything fixed and you know I mean if you've been laying in bed for almost a year 
when you try to get out of that bed, it, you may have some weaknesses that need to be built strength back up. Isn't that right, Ms. Evelyn? Yeah. Yeah. You nurse, that's right. <laughs> It's going to take some time to build up that strength to walk again. I mean, Brother Hagin shares how he, he got up the first time after he was healed and he believed. He got up and he, he got up and he just made it to the end of the bed and had a, he collapsed in the bed and went back. He, had, he couldn't do it the first time. But then he believed and eventually got to the place where he can get out of the bed and go down to the, base, down to the, the kitchen and eat, eat, eat his breakfast with his grandfather. And he did that. You know, there's, there's, there's some healing is a process. So, you know, you, you can't shoot yourself in the foot and give up in the middle of the process. You've got to keep your compassion. Same thing with walking in faith and relationship. You, you know, the minute you set your mind to, to be at peace with this person, it may take some time. You know, usually the other person is operating under some kind of misunderstanding. Like in my dad and my case, I'm in pride, and that's sinful. He's in guilt, and that's sinful. At any time, I could have, and he said it to me, <laughs> you could have come over. Yeah, <laughs> I could have. I, that's true. And I looked at him and I said, and you could have done likewise. <laughs> and that's true too. But because he felt bad about what happened, he didn't. You see, there's a misunderstanding. So, consider that. Just consider that. Let's go to Hebrews 12. Verse 12. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down. Now, considering the fact that there's probably misunderstanding somewhere or somewhere there's an ignorance, there's a blindness operating in the other person's life as much as it's probably operating in yours. Okay? So consider the hands that hang down, the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people. Well, actually, you know, that word people is kind of italicized, so it means pursue peace with all. Period. Pursue peace with all and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. So if you don't address an issue properly, what is going to happen in a, a, a lack of pursuing peace in this relationship? What's going to happen? Huh? Well, what does it say? What's going what's gonna to spring up? Bitterness. Bitterness. Anyone bitter about a relationship? Bitter. I was. I know the feeling. I do. I understand it. I mean, bitter in one relationship is just as bad as bitter in another relationship. Bitterness is bitterness, right? And look, how, and why do I say that? Well, right here. Right here. He says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fail, fall short of the grace of God. That means, you understand, God has grace. That means God has power to work here if you will yield. 
You understand what grace is, right? It's God's strength, God's ability to work in this situation. Not your strength. Not if ben, if I had to work in my strength, there'd be no relationship. There'd only be explosions that I set off. You understand me? I blow things up. That's what I do. You understand? If so I feel like somebody's going to take me, I'm shooting first. You understand? I get back at you. That's my natural disposition. And if I can't get you face to face, watch your back. <laughs> I'll get you another way. Why? Why? Because there's anger that was in me. You understand? That was my, that's how I felt. I was so angry. If somebody did something to me, I'm getting back at them. Somehow, some way. I'll call the police on at least. <laughs> you, you know, that, 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 now, I will say that, that that grew more as I got older than it was when I was younger. But, as I, you know, then I got saved. <laughs> All right? Because I wasn't going to be taken advantage of anymore. I was not going to be hurt. When, you get, when you've been hurt, that's what happens, doesn't it? You just, it's like you either break back and fall and hide and keep getting hurt, or you take action... Well, the Bible says take action, but what's it say? Pursue peace. And there's grace from God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this, by what? Bitterness, a root. See, it would have been just nice if the Paul, I believe it was Paul wrote it, but the writer said, just bitterness. That would have been that would have been a little bit nicer. But no, he goes on and he adds the description that it's a root. Well, what's a root? It, 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 anyone do any planting? Like we have our you know our uh, hostas and they're a bulb type plant, and you plant that bulb about seven inches or three. Yeah, no four or five, six inches in the ground, bury it, and it becomes a root. And every year, we have hostas coming up. Every year. Because why? There's a root. Okay, there's a root. And, I mean, it's not one and done. It's, 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 it, it, you know, there are some plants that, you know, they die at the end of the year, and that's that. And then there are other plants that come up every year, year by year. They go away, and they come up. A root. A root. Also, there are plants that have roots that never go away like a tree. Once that tree is there, it's, it stays all year round. A root of bitterness. <coughs> you see why you need to take some actions here? By the grace of God. Springing up calls trouble, and by this many become defiled. So, if this bitterness is in you, if this offense is in you, because offense brings bitterness. If this is continually in you, then everything becomes ugly to you. Everybody's out to get you. You can't be in any kind of relationship with anybody because nobody is, is, you know, understands you. They, 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 they just, they're always, they're all, you can't trust them. Bitterness. Bitterness. Call it what it is. Uh, it's not you're shy. You're offended. You're scared. You're holding back. 
you don't want to communicate. Face up to it and get that root out. Amen? There's grace of God to remove that root. Amen? That can be dealt with. And God will be on your side to do so. He loves his children. And he and if, if bitterness defiles everything, he doesn't want it in our lives because he don't want us defiled. He wants to be freely, he wants to be able to operate as he wills and, and always does good. He never does wrong. He challenges us, he'll test us even. But he's never doing wrong. And he's always trying to benefit Help us understand our likeness that he created us to be like him. He made you like, he made you a split image of him. Amen. And, you know, if you're going to be like God, you, you know, you're going to have to learn how God operates. And so he set up this instruction called life. So he can learn from it. Even nature tells us. The things about God, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, he says, spring up calls trouble, and by this, many become defiled. If you allow that bitterness to go in there, it's going to cause trouble, and it's going to defile all your relationships. You will be defined by that root in your life. It will define you. It will become a source a sore source in your life. It will be a construction that Satan has tried to build in your life to conquer through division. Understand that blame is a construction designed to separate. It's a construction that is, it, it's not just by accident. It's not just happenstance. No, it is a planned approach to life. And it will cause bitterness. And it will cause separation. And you'll get to a place where you're hating God, too. Oh, yeah. Discontent. So, you, thankfully... The Bible says, by reason of use, meaning the use of the milk and the meat of the word, because some areas we need milk and other areas we, we need to eat some steak. <laughs> kind of a conundrum. It's not like a real baby. A baby can never eat steak. They always have to have milk. But spiritually speaking, uh, you know, some areas you need milk, some areas you need oatmeal, and other areas you need meat. Yeah. Nine-ounce steak. No, you don't want nine-ounce steak. Four ounces is all you need. <laughs> Seriously, the American diet is ridiculous. Four ounces is all you need. One meal. Any more than that, that's too much. Just as a matter of health. Okay. So, spiritually, you know, there's some areas that you're going to need to be sucking on the bottle, and other areas are eating the steak. Amen. Amen. I hope to be going to a steakhouse next week. Amen. All right. Yes. Out back. Anyway. Many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Notice what it says, fornicator. Sex got involved. Think about it. When people get discontented with their partner, they go looking for another. Ain't right. Ain't right. Fornicator and profane person like Esau, who, for one morsel of food, sold his birthright. You got all these things, all these areas of the flesh working right here because of bitterness. Bitterness. And truly, Esau kind of undid himself by selling him and giving him the right 
to his birthright as firstborn to Jacob for some food. He should have valued that birthright. Like some people ought to value their marriage vows. He valued that birthright. He should have. But he didn't. And God knew it. And he said it's profane. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, think about it, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance. Though he sought it diligently with tears. He wanted it his way. He could have repented. He could have turned to God. But at that point, it was too late. At that point, Jacob got the birthright. Bless him. That's gone now. Now, of course, we know at the end, Jacob and Esau restored their relationship as twins. They're twins. And, and, uh, Esau was very blessed as well. But, you know, there's still that little bitterness that kind of messed up the children of Esau and it later came back against the children of Jacob. But then there was also a time when everything was healed and uh, Esau and Jacob were together once again. So, it happened. You know, there are some things that, you know, too little, too late. But you're supposed to pursue peace with all diligence. With everything that you have to muster. Okay? All right? Peace is our goal. And look, Psalm 34. Psalm 34, 11. Psalm 34, 11. Oh, the Lord's word is good. Amen. Amen. Verse 11 says, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life? Is that what you desire? You ever heard that say? Why don't you get a life? <laughs> I've said that thing too. Get a life. Anyway, who desire? Who is the man who desires life? Now I like to thought life, but you know, too. and loves many days that he may see good. Okay, so if that's your goal, if that's what you want to experience in life, the psalmist David here. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. And what's this last part? Seek peace and pursue it. Everybody say pursue it. it. And Peter echoes it in 1 Peter 3, 10 through 11, the same verse. Pursue it. That means... Pursue is something you do on purpose. You know, when you were going after your spouse, amen? Now, I, when I was going after my wife, I called her every day. If we weren't doing anything at work, I picked up the phone, and I knew she was here, and I just called the office. <laughs> Talk to her. Every chance, we had a chance to get together on the weekend and go out and do things. I was looking to do that. She was too. That we just never separate. <laughs> we just work together all day long. And then we just do it all day long together. Pursue it. That's something you do on purpose. Now, Romans 14. We'll do Romans 14. Nineteen. Verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make what? For peace. 
Paul's saying it a little differently, but he's saying the same truth. And the things by which one may edify another. So this is something that doesn't mean just Christians only. Oh, it does include definitely the Christians and your family. But it means everybody, if you can. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. In other words, for whatever comfortable reason you may have, whatever not getting out of your easy chair to not you don't you don't want to get out of that easy chair, you kinda of want to stay in the easy chair. And if you gotta get out of your easy chair to help make this relationship work, you see. You gotta get out of the easy chair. It's not comfortable always making, I mean, relationships can get messy, okay? They can get real messy. Right? But it's what you do from here on that makes the difference. It's not what has happened. I mean, you may have to deal with some of that result. There is reaping and sowing. But what are you going to do right now? You know, with God, it's today is the day of salvation. Amen? Today, right now, is the day of salvation. Right now. Today. Right now. Everybody say today. Now. He doesn't. Past is the past. You have today to change the future. Okay? Edify one nine, verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food or convenience or whatever, all, or, or just, you know, not, not having the to de- not go through some of the emotional grind that you may have to, like, I, I you know, had a bad day because of an, a, an old muscle memory in my emotions. And it was bad. I was hard on everybody. My family, everybody. I was hard on everybody. I hated everything. I hated the box going down the conveyor belt. That box, <laughs> these, these people, man, they're so caught up in consumerism. I mean, it was serious, man. It was, it was bad. I did a lot of, I must have made my tongue bleed because I did a lot of biting my tongue a lot of times because I, little things I wanted to unload. And why was all this discontent there? And that was like, oh, it's, and, and the Lord revealed it to me. It's just this muscle memory. you got to overcome. You know, your emotions are like that. Boy, yeah. That's an affirm agreement. <laughs> and you got to train. Thank God Hebrews says that by reason of use of God's word and truth, milk and meat of God's word, you can train the body. Amen. You can train the muscles. You can train the emotions. Understand that there may be some time of training in your emotions that you're going to have to perform and do, and just like you do a, a exercise routine or something, anything like that, something you got to do every day, you're going to have to train your emotions so that you respond to the Word of God in an appropriate fashion. Amen. Aren't you glad there's victory here? Aren't you glad that you can chain the flesh? so that you don't do or allow what the flesh wants to do as much as you used to let it. Okay? Of course, again, we all may have a bad Tuesday (laughs) that we may pop up in the daily life but somewhere. I mean, you may have some of that. But then once I started seeing that, I mean, it's not like I haven't really known some of this before. But it puzzled me because I know I have forgiven. In my heart, I have forgiven, and all I have nothing against my dad. I have nothing, and I know it in my heart. You know, it's just like that story that Brother Hagen always shared. You know, and it's this, this preacher's wife said, "I hate my mother-in-law," because he said, "If you hate your brother or you know a fellow brother, that you're going to go to hell." Because <laughs> it said the first time, something to that effect. And she was scared. And she says to Brother Hagen, I hate my mother-in-law. He says, well, then you're going to hell. I love that, honestly. Because he knew 
that really she didn't hate her mother-in-law because she's born again and spirit-filled and the love of God was inside her. And he knew it because the Lord had showed him, you know, from scriptures that Romans 5, 5. God is, the love of God has been shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Spirit. So he knew she was, she was the Holy Spirit for spoken tongues. She had the Holy Spirit. She was saved and spoken tongues. She had the Holy Spirit. So he knew the love of God was in her spirit, but what was, what was the problem there? Her emotions, her, her, her feelings, and, uh, you know, her discontent. With her mother-in-law. And he had her, he looked at her, he said, now look at me, straight in the eye, and tell me you hate your mother-in-law. And so she did, with all seriousness and sincerity, looked in his eyes and said, I hate my mother-in-law. And he said, what happened on the inside? There was kind of something scratchy down there. He said, yeah. That's the Holy Spirit in, that, that has reborn your spirit. That's your spirit, that new spirit man on the inside saying, no, the love of God's in me. I don't hate your mother. We don't hate your mother-in-law. Sounds like Smeagol. <laughs> well, anyway, we, no, go ahead. That's Lord of Ring, nerdy moment right there. <laughs> Why? See, the love of God is in your heart to do this. The Bible also says there's grace on top of that. I mean, there's an empowerment from heaven to do and move in a positive, in a, as far as it depends on you, direction. Let's go back to scriptures here. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the, the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. In other words, you don't want to, you want to recognize, you know, if I do this, this may cause, you know, stumbling. If you recognize it, then you want to do what's not going to do it. And he's saying, you know, you may not have any problem, like this what he says. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. So when you're by yourself and there's no one else and you want a glass of wine with your meal, then drink it. But if you're with a brother who's had trouble in that area, or they've been religiously taught that it's wrong to drink alcohol, and for the most part, I'll tell you, it's probably not a good idea, to do a whole lot of that a whole lot of times. Um, but have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. So the problem isn't you as far as what happens to you, but it's the problem is, is this going to hurt the person I'm with? Because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So, if what you're doing in the, is, is not going to help that other person, it's not going to help them. If you're not thinking in terms of the welfare of that other individual, but see, that's where you got to get out of your easy chair. Because it's easy to be withdrawn within yourself and stay the way. But to put yourself out for another person who, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't deserve it? No, neither do you deserve it. But God did it anyway, didn't he? You don't deserve it. Not one of us sitting here deserves it. Not one of us under the sound of my voice deserves it anything from God. None of us deserve it. 
did it stop him from loving us? Did it stop him from trying to benefit in that other person's life? Absolutely not. See, love is not dependent on that that other person does. Love is dependent on who I am, what I am doing, what I say, what I do, what I'm going to choose to do in spite of what I may feel, in spite of what the circumstance is. I'm not somebody's doormat. So you ain't getting away with hurting me. And I'm not somebody's abuser. Either one. Not good. And if you, you know, make mistakes in these areas, well, you got to repent. you got to work on changing. You've got to choose to say and do things that benefit the other person. Now, I, I will say this. We're all works in progress. So, I mean, there are areas that all of us, <coughs> you know, have cracks in our pots and we drain and drip and that's why God will say he'll continually fill you, amen? He will continue. He'd say be, be, but be filled with the Spirit. So thankfully, you know, the Bible says don't be filled with wine wearing as excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So God's into filling you, okay? So yeah, you've got some cracky you got some cracked leaky pots, but you know, God'll fill you. And you're not gonna do it without his grace, are you? Some relationships are so sensitive and so tricky and so all this. I get it. You're not going to do it apart from God's grace. So trust that the God of grace will be gracious and give to you the strength you need as far as it depends on you to do. And the Bible says that if you can't do this in faith, it's sin. In other words, even though drinking the wine or eating meat is not a sin, if you do that, not having the confidence because your spirit will let you know, yeah, maybe you ought not to you know, lay off the meat here. You understand there's no bondage of meat in the New Testament, but there are some people out there who are really... You know, they're upset about eating meat and want to eat vegetables. But a lot of times they don't eat vegetables. What they eat is carbohydrates, popcorn, breads, chips. They don't, they don't eat healthy vegetables. They eat nonsense. All right. Yeah, so... I don't mind eating vegetables if it's a sensitive thing. Now, he's talking about people who would go to a, a like a restaurant where an idol, they, didn't, they usually didn't offer up vegetables. I mean, um, there are some that did, but there, there were some, and then they would get it from the, they would go to the restaurant, and the restaurants would sell it to the people, or they'd give it to, the, you know, somebody, and they would give it, and they would say, you know, the, 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 this, is, this meat was offered up to an idol. Paul says, don't eat it then. Not because the food is anything. The food is food. It's fine. You receive it with thanksgiving. Great. It's yours. Enjoy it. Believe God and thank God for it. But for their conscience sake. You know, you can't go walking on people's conscience and think it's okay because God doesn't say it's okay. Okay? He doesn't say. So, Let's close with chapter 13 of Romans, verse 8. It says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all is summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
that includes your family members. Love does no harm to a neighbor or family member. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, and do this, knowing. Okay? In other words, really, it's in particular right now that we really should take these moves and walk in these efforts right now because the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. That's the problem, sleeping in an area. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. In other words, it's time to get over it. It's time to not waste any more time. It's time to pursue. Pursue. On purpose. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. If you're not wanting to fix and do what's best for the other person, you're walking in lust. Self-lust might even call it idolatry. You hail yourself and what you're feeling in your easy chair higher than the altar of God. But we need to be a living sacrifice. Get on that altar and be spent for the Lord. Right now. No more holding back. Now, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, when we didn't deserve it, Jesus came. He did for us, well, the unthinkable, becoming our sin. And Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your faith. I thank you for your grace. And I thank you for your help in this hour. We need it. And I thank you that you're full of help and grace to do it. And I pray, Lord, that all of us, with open eyes, all blindness removed in Jesus' name, but with open eyes, pursue peace with our loved ones, with all. And I thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for the strength, the wisdom, the heart to do it. And I thank you for this fulfillment of your word in all of us, that we love God first and foremost, and we love others as Christ loved them. Love our neighbors as ourselves. And we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord together. And I will open up the altar.